Good morning, church. Welcome again to this gathering of the church here at what we call the garden, which is just a building. But you guys are New Eden, the church, the body of Christ. So um, we're here as we do every week, which is to celebrate the life, death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus and fix our eyes on who he is. So for those of you who don't know me, my name is Joel McCarty. I have the privilege of serving as one of the pastors here at New Eden Church. And so if I've not got the opportunity to meet you, I would love to do that at some point. So maybe hang around afterwards. If you have some time, I'd love to meet you and just get to know you. So for um, our New Eden family, like Sarah Beth just mentioned, we are collecting candy to hand out at the downtown trick or treat. So I encourage you to bring some, help us out with that. Um, We have a bin up front in the lobby. You can drop that off. Um, And again, if you've got kids, great opportunity to come participate, be in the community, get to know uh, some, of your, some of our neighbors here on Bank Street and areas downtown. There'll be a whole trail. Me and my family will be here. Some others from our missional community will be here as well. Um, yeah, so getting ready for that Halloween season, right? On Friday night, uh, my family and I went costume shopping, which is always a great experience with young kids. Um, that is sarcasm. Um, if you have young kids, you know that. Um, to this point in their journey, you know, I've got a nine, seven, five, and three-year-old. So my kids have typically been like superheroes or like Disney princesses or something, characters like that. But this year, my son, KJ, said, I want to be something, quote, actually scary. So <laughs> that's what he said. He wanted to be something scary. So um, I think we finally settled on this Scream costume. My wife was a little... Um, yeah, like she wasn't sure about it, right? And I kind of pushed back and I was like, you know, it's just for fun. I think he probably wants to scare his sisters, whatever. And like this specific one has like fake blood like running down the face. It's like when we got home and tried it on, I was like, yeah, maybe she was, I haven't even told her this. I was like, maybe she was right. She just gave me that look like, told you so. So, um, but I was like, well, too late now. We opened it, we paid the money. It is what it is. <laughs> so, um, but, but around this time of year, right, you got... Um, things like Halloween, you got things like the Day of the Dead, and these traditions and holidays, and we find ourselves talking about things like ghosts, and maybe the supernatural, and even things like death. Now, different Christians have different beliefs about how we should engage uh, with holidays and traditions like this, and that's something you need to decide for you and your family. Um, So, but regardless of whether you're Christian or not, there is something about the supernatural that we are intrigued by. I think there's something about death that piques our curiosity because it's, there's so much unknown, right? Like people don't come back from the dead, right? So it's like, we don't know what that's like. like we can talk about it. And, and as Christians, you know, we've got some different beliefs about that. But the reality is, even if like media and even ourselves, like we, we have like horror movies and supernatural ideas and shows or other media, and we can kind of, you know, have fun with that. But the reality is when we're faced with actual death, as a reality, like it's not fun. Like it's not a joking matter. There's nothing fun about it at all. Um, We can wear costumes and dress up and pretend, but in real life, death is a disruptor. It disrupts relationships, it disrupts rhythms of life. It destroys and corrupts everything that it touches. And it's been that way ever since man rebelled against God in the Garden of Eden years ago. The darkness of humans chasing after their own pleasures and their own idols only leads to death and destruction. And this death and destruction is real. But just because it's real, because the scriptures don't ignore the reality of death, just because it's real doesn't mean it's final. For those of us who do call ourselves Christians, who follow the way of Jesus, our whole belief system is predicated on the fact that Jesus of Nazareth who lived and breathed and died, that he beat sin when he rose from death on a Sunday morning over 2,000 years ago. And because of this, we believe that eternal life, not the finality of death, is ultimately what we have to look forward to. And that's what we're going to see as we close out our Daniel series today. Um, As you see, and as you heard, we are continuing in our series through the book of Daniel. And like I just said, we're closing out that series today. So we've typically taken it about a chapter at a time up to this point, but now we're going to take the last three chapters because it's kind of all one chunk that's meant to be taken together. So chapter 10 through 12, and this will close out our time in the Daniel series. It's all kind of one final vision. So we're covering a lot. We're going to have to stay high level. 
There's no way I can cover everything and answer all your questions. If you want all of your definitive questions answered, you can show up to our community group that meets on Sunday nights and we will argue, about, I mean, discuss, right? Is that what we're supposed to call it? So last Sunday night, we, we not only discussed like what we believe about things like the end times and stuff, we also discussed how we're supposed to discuss it. So we went really deep, like it was great. So, but we love it. There's, those are great avenues for that. But today, for our purposes, we're gonna stay kind of high level, right? Um, and, and I've already kind of laid a lot of groundwork in previous sermons. You can go listen to those. Um, but yeah, so, so quick review again. Remember, first six chapters of Daniel are stories of God's faithfulness. Last six chapters are primarily visions of God's faithfulness. They are the theme of the book, God's sovereignty and faithfulness, okay? So we're in what's called apocalyptic literature. I'm not gonna reintro this genre of literature, but just remember, there's gonna be a lot you don't get, and that's completely okay, all right? Um, so before we start by looking at chapter 10, let me kind of tell you how we're gonna work through it. I'm not gonna read the entirety of the text. It would be like 15 minutes. We've done that every week, but we're not doing it this week. Um, it's a big chunk. We're gonna kind of take it a chapter at a time. So we'll look at chapter 10, chapter 11, chapter 12. I'll read a few key verses throughout, and I'm just gonna summarize summarize it and you can go read it later. So toward the end though, I think we'll see that the main theme of resurrection life comes through loud and clear. And like my hope for you, no matter how you came in today, is that you leave more hopeful in the resurrection of Jesus and God's work in the world through that. Both like massive cosmic scale, maybe that's where you're at today, or maybe like super personal, like your life just feels like it's in shambles, that Jesus deals with both of those and can resurrect what seems to be broken. So let's dive in. I'm gonna start by reading the first few verses of chapter 10, verses one through six. Um, and we're reading from the CSB translation if you wanna follow along. It'll also be on the screen. It says, in the third year of King Cyrus of Persia, a message was revealed to Daniel who was named Belteshazzar. The message was true and was about a great conflict. So we're setting up what we're about to see. He understood the message and an understanding of the vision. So this is actually setting up the next three chapters. And then we get kind of more specific about how it starts. In those days, I, Daniel, was mourning for three full weeks. I didn't eat any rich food, no meat or wine entered my mouth, and I didn't put any oil on my body until the three weeks were over. On the 24th day of the first month, as I was standing on the bank of the great river, the Tigris, I looked up and there was a man dressed in linen with the belt of gold from Euphaz around his waist. His body was like beryl. His face was like the brilliance of lightning. His eyes like flaming torches. His arms and feet like the gleam of polished bronze. And the sound of his words like the sound of a multitude. So, this is a couple of years after the last vision that Daniel saw. He's towards the end of his life. We know this by now. He gets kind of one final vision. So for some reason, Daniel is in mourning, probably over his people and that they're still in exile, but it's to the point that he has no meat or wine, kind of the normal luxuries of his life. He's kind of setting to the side. Uh, you even get some random cultural tidbits in here. Like, I love this. It says he didn't put any oil on his body. Now, culturally in here, if you're a white woman, you're like, oh my gosh, he didn't have any essential oils. <laughs> like, how did he sleep at night without peppermint and eucalyptus on his body, right? That's not actually what's going on here because Daniel most likely wasn't white. This is moisturizing oil, like lotion, right? And if you're a person of color, you'll probably identify with this. Daniel did not want to be ashy, okay? And if you don't know what being ashy is, ask me afterwards. I'll expand your cultural understanding and education, and we can talk about it, okay? So he was just keeping his body moisturized. But in the case of mourning, he's like doing without all the normal kind of daily things. And maybe you've been there, right? Like where you're, you're like just sitting at home, you don't go out to eat, you don't call friends, maybe you don't even bathe for a few days, like I'm not being gross, it's like you're just in mourning, right? You're in grief. And so that's kind of just what this is saying here, right? So towards the end of this long fast and time of mourning, he is met on the bank of a great river. And then we see this vision of this man who is described in like, larger than life terms. Most commentators agree that this is not simply an angel. This would have been what is called a theophany. I asked my son, I, I was I, sometimes, actually it's the first time I did, I don't know what I said, sometimes. I was like, I'm gonna go over my sermon with my son. We were driving, had a 30 minute drive. And so I was just kind of talking to it in a kid. It can be helpful. And so I said, do you know what a theophany is? He's like, can you use it in a sentence? I'm like, let me just tell you. So 
So a theophany, a theophany is a visible representation of God to human. You see this with Jacob wrestling with God, right? You see this a few different times in the Old Testament. And so that seems to be what's going on here. So actually all of chapter 10, before we even get to the vision, is basically Daniel and God's interaction. So I'm not gonna go over it all, but Daniel gets really weak, obviously falls to his face and faints. God has to like touch him and tell him to stand up like you're okay. Um, he tells him you're treasured by God. Again, mind blowing, we looked at that last week, but this, this being, God goes on to tell Daniel, hey, I'm here because your prayers have been heard. And there's some weird stuff going on in here about like spiritual warfare that we don't all fully understand. But I think the big thing is like, God talks about this great battle he's fighting against this angel over like the, what's called the Prince of Persia and like these heavenly cosmic warfares. And God stops everything to respond to the prayer of one of his people. It's crazy. Right, that's the point that's going on here. And he goes on to tell Daniel, be encouraged, don't have fear, have peace. I'm here to tell you this vision. And this continues to remind and affirm us as all of Daniel has done, that God is present with his people in their suffering. Big picture, like nations raging and like minor things that seem to be minor, he cares. God will move heaven and earth in response to the prayers of his saints who humble themselves and seek his face. And so no matter what mourning or suffering or persecution you might find yourself in seemingly alone, God is present and engaged. And in due time, he will meet you and reveal himself to you. That's chapter 10. Now we move on to chapter 11. It's the longest of these final three chapters. There is a lot. It's this long and complex vision about kings and empires and great battles. You don't really even see metaphor like beast. You actually see kings and kingdoms are listed. And it's basically what's gonna happen over the next like four or 500 years or so, right? And so for sake of time, I'm not gonna read any of chapter 11. I'm gonna try to just summarize, okay? Basically all scholars, and this might be a little like teachy for some of you, you can tune out and hop back in when we get to chapter 12 in a minute if you want, or you can follow along if you like this. But all scholars are in agreement about like the first two thirds or so of the vision. Um, there's, there's not many differences. It seems to reference actual historical events like Alexander the Great and his fall, and then these different four kingdoms that come up. We've seen some of that already. And, and it's very common in apocalyptic literature to kind of have this repeating of actual events with maybe different focal points. That seems to happen in Revelation, seems to happen here in Daniel. And so the difference here is the focus and intensity of these prophecies and that kind of begins to flesh itself out in verse five. And so verses five through 20, moving through the chapter, have this record, the main point is this ongoing power struggle between what's called the kingdom of the north, which would have been like here on the map, and the kingdom of the south, which would have been like Egypt and over here to the nation of Israel. And kind of the point you see here is Israel is sandwiched right in between these two kingdoms of the north and the kingdom of the south. And there's this ongoing power struggle that affects Israel. And they find themselves being kind of passively persecuted because of just the ongoing power struggles of the age. And so they're fighting back and forth. They're ravaging the land of Israel, you know, just kind of fighting to, to get control. And so that's kind of what goes on. The South would have been the Ptolemy reign. The North would have been the Seleucid reign. You can go read about all that in history taking place over the next few hundred years. Jerusalem's caught right in the middle of this power, like the struggle for worldly power. That's five through 20. And then in verse 21 through, I think it's like 35, it kind of zooms in even closer. So what the text seems to be doing is kind of like focusing us in on this persecution of God's people. And so there's this kingdom of the North who takes over by intrigue, this king of the North, excuse me. This would have been Antiochus IV, which I've said, Antiochus, which I think is the wrong way of pronouncing it now that I know, but whatever, who knows? These old names, you just say whatever you want. So Antiochus IV, okay, I've talked about him in previous sermons. I'm not gonna re-preach that, but he actively persecutes God's people. That seems to be 21 to 35. Most people are in agreement on all that. Then you get to verse 36 and things get kind of crazy. There's different views, okay? Basically, you still have ongoing teaching about a king who's gonna do things, but the description of this king can't match Antiochus. 
because it seems to be more cosmic, more like big, like otherworldly, and the evil just like ramps up more and more. So we get even more hyper-focused. And so what a lot of scholars, what I kind of tend to believe is that the rest of chapter 11 is describing something larger than life, something that New Testament authors will pick up on and call the Antichrist, an Antichrist figure. Daniel doesn't use that language anywhere, but other authors do later in the New Testament. And so as best as I can tell, what seems to be going on is there's this kind of collapsing of, of history. So it's uh, Daniel's prophesying here, this history that takes place, time of Christ, then like end times. And you've got these like moments in history, these big markers that when you look at them through a prophetic lens, it's called a telescoping prophecy. And so if you were looking at a telescope at a mountain range and you see multiple mountain peaks from this perspective, I have no idea how far apart they are. I mean, they look collapsed, they look similar. But if I move to this perspective, I start kind of seeing more and we have the privilege kind of in our day and age of, of looking and kind of seeing, but Daniel's just taking the prophecy like this and getting the highlights, which is why, again, we stick with the, like, the, the, the highlights and the main points are these mountain peaks that we're looking at. That's why we stay kind of high level as we preach through this series, okay? So kind of group together, whatever exactly it means, a lot of different thoughts. We are told that this evil ruler will invade the beautiful land, this metaphor for the people of God, that he will be in fury, he will annihilate and destroy many, he will even magnify himself above God. The only God he will honor, we're told, is called the God of fortress, which means power or control. That's all he cares about. That's his end goal. And so as a result of the pursuit of that, he will destroy a multitude of people. And so this seems to be describing some larger than life Armageddon type battle that many believe involves the Antichrist. Antiochus seems to simply be like a precursor or a foreshadowing of that. A lot of different thoughts about it. I'm not exactly sure where I land on all of them. Um, every time like one view convinces me, then I like go read another and I'm like, oh dang, okay, they got some good points there. And so I end up kind of like landing on this idea that maybe all of them have merit and value in one way or another. And that maybe like the way God wrote his scriptures and prophecy was that it's, it's probably more like articulate than any of us could even wrap our brains around, okay? And we'll know one day. So we hold that stuff with an open hand. Regardless of where you land on all this stuff, let's look at the main patterns that are predicted in this text. What are the things that we can all agree on? Okay, so if you tuned out, hop back in now, okay? So the things that we can all agree on, the core truths that we need to hold on to and be reminded of, what are those? In the midst of all the things we can't grasp and figure out, whether it be like how to just parent your kids or like end times prophecy. Like what are the things that we need to hold on to? Because even for Daniel, at the end of the book, like very end, in chapter 12, he says, I heard everything you said, but I don't understand it. And he had God explaining it to him. Like he had an angel explaining it to him. So there's gonna be things we don't understand. So the big thing that seems to be going on, the pattern that seems to be established is that the wickedness of the day is always present, but there will be moments in history where it becomes more intense and more focused on God's people. It gets worse and worse. And this teaches us that God's people will face persecution. Sometimes it's like passive because you're just kind of in the middle of the culture power struggles of the day, right? Whether that be like physical or just like the, the different truth battles that are going on in our culture. Sometimes it's more focused and active, like right in your face seeking to destroy us. Look at the persecuted church all around the world. Like that becomes more active. But in the midst of it all, what's really cool, like tucked into chapter 11, there's a lot going on, right? Go read it later. But tucked into it, like the apex of the persecution, we get to see a couple different responses by God's people. The first response we see is compromise. In verse 31, we're told that this evil king will favor those who, quote, abandon the covenant. So they've chosen, and even says that with it, the flattery of this evil king. So there's attractive nature of this worldly king kind of saying, hey, I'm pursuing power and I will protect you and share some of this power with you if you will follow my truth and my ways versus Yahweh, the God of the scriptures. So that's the compromise, right? But then we see another response in verse 32 through 35 that's meant to encourage us. Encourage us. And it's a response of conviction. We read of these people who, quote, know their God. 
And they're described as like having insight or being wise. And I love that the definition of wisdom is knowing God. It isn't a worldly definition of wisdom, right? The wise thing is to compromise, to seek safety and fortress and protection at all costs. But from the eyes of God, the wise ones are the ones that actually lose their life to the sword and to the flame is what we're told. Martyrs, those are actually the wise ones. See, even in the midst of great patterns of evil and wickedness, even with great temptation to a, an allure to align with the power-hungry empires of the day, there is an encouragement to stand firm because in the midst of the pattern of evil that's depressing when you read it, there is also a promise. I love the way I get this language of a pattern and a promise. I don't even know if it's original with them, but the guys from the Bible Project who talk about it in this way, so giving them credit. I love the way they kind of bring us back to that, that as we get into the weeds of Daniel, like we zoom out and we see just this pattern and a promise. See, Daniel is honest about evil and wickedness that abounds in kings and empires and even in the hearts of God's people. It's a vicious pattern, but it's also full of promises that God will come through. That when all is said and done, that's my new phrase for a while, there is hope in the midst of it. There is a God who will deliver and come through. And I love that that's where the book of Daniel ends in chapter 12. That's what chapter 12 is all about. After this great evil king is destroyed, look at chapter 12 verses one through three and let's read that. It says, at that time, Michael, the great prince who stands watch over your people, so it'll be an angel, he will rise up. There will be a time of distress such as never has occurred since nations came into being until that time. Again, you see like hyper-focused, high-level evil. But at that time, this is written to Daniel, who's mourning over his people. All your people who are found written in the book will escape. Many who sleep in the dust of the earth will awake some to eternal life and some to disgrace and eternal contempt. Those who have insight defined as those who know God will shine like the bright expanse of the heavens and those who lead many to righteousness like the stars forever and ever. We're told that all those written in the book, presumably what's called the book of life, later, all those written therein will escape. And there will be this final resurrection. Again, we could talk about the timing of all this, but we we know it's going to happen. It's just a matter of when. And there's this final resurrection where those who know God will awake to eternal life. And those who have rejected him, the workers of iniquity, who have persecuted, who have rebelled, those who who have chosen to follow false gods will awake to what's called disgrace and eternal contempt. Those who have true insight, the truly wise ones, though they were destroyed by the sword and the fire, they will awake and they will resurrect and shine like the bright expanse of the heavens, like stars forever. This is a metaphor. You're not gonna be a floating star. You're gonna be an embodied, fully human person. But this is the promise in the midst of the pattern of human depravity. When it's at its most intense, and you guys have been there in your own lives, when all hope seems to be lost, when evil and death and darkness seems to be winning and seems to be prevailing, there is a promise of one like the son of man who is able to turn things around, to bring hope from the ashes, to resurrect what was dead, to bring rejoicing and peace to the persecuted that passes all human understanding. See, as our prophecies have have zoomed in and found sharper focus about the intensity of evil, as we see cosmic battles described for us, let's not forget that all of this finds its conclusive fulfillment in the work of Jesus of Nazareth. In Daniel 12, after this promise of resurrection is given, there's this mysterious person standing on the banks and he asks, how long until these things happen? Until resurrection takes place, how long? Like evil abounds, how long? And this same cry is picked up in Revelation. It's the cry of all the saints that have gone before us, of suffering saints throughout history who have said, how long? And the answer from God 
is the life, death, burial, resurrection, and return of his son. See, we all long for some form of resurrection. We all long for our lives to have more meaning and value than what we feel like they have. In the midst of maybe our mundane jobs, maybe our broken lives and the mistakes we've made, we yearn for something greater, some utopia, some kind of healing and closure to the griefs and the deaths of this life. And often what we do, many of us, we try to then go recreate it and rebuild it in our own strength through conquest, persuasion, politics, whatever it is. We do it on a small scale. I might not be able to control the big old world out there, but I can build the perfect family and raise the perfect kids and have the perfect career, whatever it is for you that you're seeking fulfillment in. Right Or sometimes like we know that's a mess, so let's go large scale. Like let me run for office, there's nothing wrong with that, but let me like change the whole world through politics and policies and procedures. And here's the problem when we're all seeking our own utopias. All of our definition of utopia is different. And so when my utopia comes into conflict with your utopia, all we're left with is conflict and strife and war. And now we're repeating the vicious pattern of violence evil towards our fellow man, rebellion against God. And we only make it worse. Don't know if you've been there to try to pick up the pieces, right? It's like the kid who spills milk and he's trying to make it better and then he wipes it off the counter and it falls on the ground. Like that's what we're doing with our lives. See, the Christian view, those of us that follow Jesus, we believe that utopia and eternal life cannot be achieved by the hands of man. This is something that only happens to Christ. This is a supernatural endeavor. This isn't something you can conjure up and kind of rebuild on your own. We need a death to life miracle, not a better political system or more influence or stronger families because it's all broken at its core. Like in the scriptures, we even read that the earth itself is groaning to be restored. Like it knows something's not right. And we even find that in our own bones, Christian or not, like we long for something better. Like I said at the beginning, there is something about death that we're intrigued by because of the finality of it. Like our, our chances at getting it right are over at that point. I might even propose that the reason I think many of us become so fascinated with evil and death through holidays and tradition is because it's a way to cope with that which frightens us most deeply. Like we're so out of control when it comes to death. Like we can feign control and fake control in our own lives while we're still living, but death, it's over. But there is one who in the midst of it all promises the hope of resurrection. And there's a lot as Christians we don't know. You might have Christian friends that tell you they know a lot and know everything. Maybe they do. There's a lot I don't know. Like, I can't explain to you all the ins and outs of Daniel. There's a lot of questions I have, a lot of doubts I have. And I'm gonna say it here because it, I have to. At the end of the day, there is one thing that we stake our flag on. Yeah. One hill that we're willing to die on. That Jesus of Nazareth was God in the flesh. Mm-hmm. That he lived, died, was buried, and rose again on the third day. And that in doing so, he changed the world. He conquered death and hell. And that all who trust in him, we follow him through death into eternal life. And that is a resurrection reality that nothing can prevent. Jesus showed up in flesh. Not through a prophetic vision that might have been a little blurry and hard to understand. Like he is the fulfillment of all prophecy. He showed up with skin on, God with skin on, as a tiny helpless baby, sovereignly confined in the flesh that he himself created. And the first cry of this baby was the launching of a cosmic war against the pattern of wickedness and death that had existed since the fall of man. The way this king showed up was not like any king of this age had to show off his power and his might. Don't mess with me. We're first. We win. That's not Jesus. It leads all the way to his death on the cross, which is like the apex of this battle, this weekend of death. 
It was God's plan to defeat evil and wickedness without utterly destroying the workers of it because he becomes sin on the cross to sacrifice for us so we can become his perfect goodness. The death on the cross was also God's way of eliminating the power and sting of death because by Christ entering into the darkest thing that humanity faces, he was defeating it. He says, bring your worst shot, the worst that evil can do. And I'm gonna get back up. You're not gonna phase me. And he embarrasses all the powers of darkness. He exposes what true wisdom is. And how does he respond? When all the powers of darkness throw their worst at him, he responds not in violence, but in radical forgiveness. And he puts a stop to the pattern of wickedness by responding in a way unlike any earthly king. But make no mistake, his death does not mean that he has lost. Because even like, like if there was ever a time where it looked like evil had won, where, where tribulation and persecution was at its worst, God somehow, in the upside down sovereign way of his working, he was moving creation to a plan of redemption. This is what we see in the resurrection. What does Christ do? He rises from the dust and he, he rises again to wake and never die again, we're told. He will never die again. He is what we're, what's called the first fruits. I explain this to my son, like take an apple tree, right? And the first apple that comes is not like the end. It's the start. There's a whole bunch more apples coming. And Christ is described as the first fruits of those who die and then rise again to never die again. And you are brought into that because of the work of Christ. All who trust in his life, death, burial, and resurrection, what we call the gospel, the good news, this announcement that Jesus has won, when you believe this, you are brought into his story. And he has promised to return and bring a new heavens and a new earth where his people will reign with him forever. All evil will be gone, cast outside the kingdom forever. The smoke of the fire pit that Satan and death and sin and darkness are thrown into. We're told in Revelation, it goes up forever and ever, which shows the finality of that defeat. So no matter what it looks like here on earth, no matter how bad it gets, no matter the sword of the fire we face, God wins and he will bring his people through to shine like the stars of the expanse. This is the hope of resurrection. This is the hope of Daniel, this crazy wild book that we've journeyed through. And this hope of resurrection is where we stake our flag. We can discuss and debate and talk we can find practical ways to cope with death and grief and pain. We can see a therapist and counselors and educate ourselves. We can enjoy holidays and even poke fun at death. That's kind of what I see Halloween at from a Christian perspective. And don't hear me wrong, like go do all those things. Those are all things that I do. They, they are good things. But if Christ is not raised... If Christ did not get back up out of the grave, literally, physically, bodily, on Sunday morning, everything is in vain. Go eat, drink, and be merry, for tomorrow you die. Join the worldly forces of power and power hungry, seeking all that. You might as well get what you can while you can and live the best life you can now because it's all over soon. But in fact, as the apostle Paul said, Christ has been raised. And our hope, it is not in vain. This is real. It is sure. You've been given the very spirit of God as the down payment. Like, so you get glimpses of it through the spirit's work in your life of resurrection and hope. And like he, he's transforming us and healing our families and our communities. And it's a foretaste of what's gonna happen in its fullness because it's real. If you're sick of the hate and the vitriol and the evil in the world, if you're longing for justice to roll like a river, if you find yourself attracted by big visions of utopia and healing and love, if you are looking for someone to come fix the mess, but who also intimately crawls down into it with you, what you're looking for, whether you know it or not, is Jesus. He's the only one who can redeem us 
and like everything on a big cosmic scale. So like the invitation, as we hear the declaration of the good news that Jesus is king, that he is savior, is to come. Come to the table, feast, maybe for the first time today. Maybe you've not experienced Christ like that and like something's happening. You're like, I think I might actually freaking believe this. Come feast at the table because there is room for you. And this vision of what Christ is doing actually changes us. See, the the great thing about the gospel is it is this future thing. And we say like, yes, our hope isn't in politics and policies and, and, and strong families and godly influence. But as we like have this vision that bursts forth into the here and now and actually creates some of those things, it creates small pictures and glimpses. And so we engage in real flesh and bone things. It's not just, oh, sweet, by and by, let's just sit back and wait. No, we engage not to win every cultural war, because we don't care about that. Jesus has won it. It's to give small glimpses and foretaste through your families, as you're just hospitable, as you just stumble along trying to like raise your kids or as you suffer well or as you face death in your family and somehow the spirit like allows you to grieve with authenticity and honesty, but also like this rock solid deep hope that comes sometimes through tears and groaning and mourning. And all those are like little foretaste appetizers of the feast to come. This is the vision that allowed Daniel to remain steadfast. This is the hope that caused the people who stay steadfast in the midst of suffering and pain. See, at the end of the book of Daniel, he lives this quite tumultuous but full and long life. Daniel still has a lot of questions. Like I said, he still doesn't understand it all, but he's left with this promise. In verse nine, Daniel's told, Daniel, as for you, go on your way. Continue to build houses and live in them. Continue to plant gardens and eat their produce. Seek the good of the place where you found yourself. Go on your way. He's even told, hey, the wicked, they're gonna keep acting wickedly. It's like, it's going to keep happening. Don't be surprised by that. But those that wait have hope. God is coming. And you can get into all the days and stuff later. But Daniel 12, 13, let's read this together as we close. He says, but as for you, go on your way to the end. You will rest. That's death. Just described as a a rest to get ready for the freaking party. Then you will rise to receive your allotted inheritance at the end of the days. This is the hope. There is an inheritance. Peter says it this way, 1 Peter 1, 3 through 4, blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ because of his great mercy he's given us new birth into a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead and into an inheritance that is imperishable. Like he's using strong language, undefiled and unfading, kept in heaven for you. Go read the rest of 1 Peter 1 later. It's incredible. So as we close out the book of Daniel, let me encourage you as God's people, go on your way. Live bold and winsome lives, stumbling though you may be, for the glory of God and the good of your neighbor, even the ones that hate you, You need the spirit to do that. Trust the faithfulness and sovereignty of God over your life. Even when it seems like all hope is lost and he's not in control and he's not present. We've seen this time and time again in the book of Daniel. And in the end, you will rest, whether it's through persecution, whether it's through great suffering and pain, suddenly or through natural means, at the end, all of us, all of our fleshly bodies will decay. Our flesh will rot But in the end, you will rise to receive a new body, a new soul, a new mind. All the things you struggle with, gone. The whole works. And all this is possible because of the supernatural work of Christ who has secured for you, along with all the saints who've gone before and behind, an imperishable inheritance of life eternal. And this is the resurrection hope that Daniel closes out with.